All right, I think we'll get started now. Thank you for joining us tonight. <clears throat> My name is Kristen Bishop and I support communications and community engagement on the Willamette River Crossing Project. We're gonna start recording the meeting now, just to let you all know, and we'll have this recording available on the project website after the meeting. <clears throat> I'd like to briefly run through the agenda before we begin, so you know what to expect tonight. First, we'll provide a, a brief project overview. Following that, we'll focus on construction activities, including methods, timeline, and location. We'll then get into mitigation measures and address some of the impacts that we've heard that you're concerned about. These include traffic and access, noise and vibration, dust and air quality, safety and security, and staging and haul routes. We'll then provide you with some information on how to stay connected and informed, and we'll finish up with a Q&A. We've allocated a good amount of time for this, so we have the opportunity to address your questions and concerns. And if we get to a point before 8 p.m. where we have no further questions, then we'll finish up early. I did want to take this opportunity before we get started in earnest to remind you of a couple of things. First, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to leave questions and comments. We welcome your feedback and questions. Although you can ask your questions throughout the presentation, we'll respond to them toward the end during the Q&A session. This presentation will cover construction impacts and mitigation measures that the design build team will undertake to decrease impacts. Our Q&A will also be limited to these topics. If you have any questions outside of these areas, please direct them to the team on the project webpage <clears throat> as they will not be addressed tonight. Another reminder, during the presentation, you'll see that we have some polling questions that we'll ask you to answer. This is a way for us to get to know you and it will give you another opportunity to share feedback with us. We'll have one of these polling questions come up shortly. If you have technical issues with your Zoom functionality, you always have the option of dialing in instead. To do this, click on the arrow by the mute button and Zoom will guide you through the process of switching to phone. If technical problems persist, please know that this meeting will be recorded as will the Q&A session. Finally, please be respectful. There's a lot to cover tonight and we wanna provide equal opportunities for everyone to share their feedback. Next, I'd like to introduce you to some of our project team members that you'll be hearing from tonight. First, Tim Collins, City of Portland Water Bureau Project Manager. Nolan Fury, Design Build Project Manager at JW Fowler. Katie Asher, Senior Communications Spe Specialist with the City of Portland Water Bureau. Before I kick it over to Tim to welcome you all, we'd like to ask more about you all by throwing a poll question out up onto the screen. For this, I'd like to introduce you to Lauren Wheeler, my public involvement colleague on the project. Lauren. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Kristen mentioned, we'll run a couple of polls tonight. The first one will help to warm up your poll taking skills. Um, and it's going to give us a sense of who else in the in the virtual space with us tonight. Um, this poll is going to pop up on the middle of your screen should happen right about now um, and select the response that you most identify with. So our first question, who do we have in the room tonight? You might be living at the River Place or working there. Maybe you have a business that you're operating nearby. Maybe you're just very curious about this complex project. Getting good responses here. 75% living at River Place. We've got some a few folks who have businesses. That's great. And a few 15% or so are just interested to learn more about the project. We'll give it another few seconds. All right, 
Perfect. So yeah, we've got, there you go. A lot of folks living here. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I, I'd now like to introduce uh, Tim Collins, who works with the Portland Water, Water Bureau, uh, and he's the project manager for this project. Tim. Tim, you're muted. Tim, you're muted. Oh, rookie mistake right at the beginning. I hate that. Sorry about that. I'm Tim Collins. Um, I'm the project manager for the Willamette River Crossing. Um, I have had the pleasure of uh, talking to a few of you in the past. I've been involved on this project for, for quite a few years now, but I figured I'd give a little bit of intro of myself. Um, I've been working at the Water Bureau for 25 years now, it's kind of hard to believe, and 10 of those years I've been working on this project. So um, you may wonder why I've been so committed to, to stay with the project for 10 years. Um, I guess because I really believe this is a necessary part of making Portland safer, um, making it more resilient and making it more livable. Um, I also live on the West side, so I, ha I have some um, bias towards this as well. Um, a little bit about my background. I'm, uh, I have two degrees. I have a degree in mechanical engineering and started my, my engineering uh, experience off at Boeing. Um, I went back to school and got my degree in geotechnical engineering. So I have a lot of experience in seismic matters and uh, landslides, large, large excavations. Um, and as part of um, my background with the Water Bureau, I did another big tunnel project at the Sandy River Crossing. So this was kind of a, a building on of that um, experience. So, um, and I figured we wanted to introduce you uh, as a as a community back into as we as we have moved the project forward and it's moved and it's had some iterations. Um, we wanted to bring to you the information that is most up to date because I know that we like I said I've been talking to you for for several years now and the project has had several iterations. It's a it's a complex project. It's I mentioned I had done a tunneling project in the past, but the last time it was out in a rural area. Now we're in the heart of Portland. So there's just a lot more complexities involved with this project. And we'll talk through some of those, those issues tonight. But I think the most important piece that, that folks, I, I believe you're interested in, is how is this going to impact the environment? What are the noises going to be like? What's the traffic going to be like? Um, so, so tonight, we feel like we have a good start on these things. We have a good, good example of what you might expect when we're, when we're out there. So we wanted to present that directly um, to the community so that you could ask the people who had the most insight into those those uh, designs and those impacts. So another polling question. If an earthquake were to happen right now, there might not be much water on the west side. Little caveat is not much you'd want to drink. Um, oh, I hate to say, but the poll came up right on the question. <laughs> I can't read the question. I can um, read the question if you need some help. Okay, thank you. Could you read it, please? Uh, if an earthquake were to happen right now, there might not be water on the west side of Portland. How much water should each person have stored for emergency purposes? And the options here are, wait, what do you mean? Emergency water supply? Um, one gallon of water per person per day for two weeks for a total of 14 gallons. Um, or the third option, I plan to use a camping filter on the Willamette River. I feel like the tone of my voice may have <laughs> given the answer. Maybe. Um, we've got folks responding here. Got a lot of folks who um, think the answer is a gallon per person per day for two weeks. We've got a few folks who would use their camping filter their handy camping filter on the Willamette River. A few folks maybe are unsure. 
don't know how to respond to that. Got 75% of folks have responded. Maybe we can get just a few more. Okay. All right. The poll has closed. So we got, uh, we got some smart go people here. So that's that's correct. The middle one is a recommendation. Um, I do want to kind of put that in in perspective. If you have a family of four, that's nearly equivalent to a 55 gallon drum in your garage or your basement. So it's a lot. It's a lot of water. Um, and I will tell you the people who selected a camping filter all after a big earthquake, pretty much all of the sewage in Portland is going to go to the Willamette River. So I would re even with a camping filter, it won't last very long with that sort of contamination. So um, best to have something clean to uh, to start off with. So a little bit about, um, you know, why why are we doing this project? So um, at the current moment, the water supply, and I'll have a have a graphic in a minute, but the water supply from for Portland comes from the east side, comes from the Bull Run, and flows by gravity from the Cascades to Portland. And we have six um, crossing locations, and all six of the crossing locations are pretty much go through the near surface materials that are on the Willamette River. And these materials are soft by nature because they're relatively new from the Willamette. And then as the pioneers and more recent development has happened on the river, we've added more soft, loose sediments on the river. And so what we believe is that during a big earthquake, those sediments will move into the Willamette river and they will rip apart the pipes. So we've done quite a few studies on this and we're we're fairly confident that all of the crossings that are across the Willamette to the west side will be damaged in some magnitude during a big earthquake. So the the core element is that the west side of Portland will be significantly hampered of getting water after a really big earthquake. So here's one of the main reasons why. So this picture is taken from Haiti. Um, and so that Haiti had a really big earthquake a decade or so now. And this is what we call lateral spreading. So what happens is when you shake um, loose sediments that are saturated with water, they basically become quasi-fluid, like it's called liquefaction. And, and when these materials have a place to run to, namely the shore of the Willamette River, they will move to that shore and they will carry the non-liquefied soil on top of them. So even if they're not in the liquefied soil, they will carry the pipes and whatever else is on in that material into the Willamette River. And we have done studies on this and we believe that the Willamette, the shoreline of the Willamette River will move up to six to 10 feet from where it sits right now all up and down the Willamette River. So there really isn't a safe place on the very close near shore. And so what we're, what we're doing with this particular crossing is we're putting it to a depth where that liquefaction is zero or very near to zero. Um, and so that, that way we can avoid these loose soils at the top and mitigate the damage that would happen uh, during a big earthquake. And we also believe that the, because of these things are, it's hard to build things underground, as um, as you might imagine. Um, we think that it's likely that we won't have reliable water on the west side of the Willamette for six months or more, or or at least water that we wouldn't want to drink because it's we might have water, but there'd be low pressure or there'd be problems with leakage, um, and so it would not most likely not be potable without boiling it or some other treatment. So I want to talk through, um, I kind of already alluded to this, but this is kind of a better graphic here. Um, so on the on the right hand side, you can see the, the Bull Run watershed and we have two reservoirs. So the the we pipe, we have a headworks facility from those reservoirs and then we bring the water in three pipes to the west 
into the Portland area. And the one of the the, the previous tunnels that I was uh, mentioning that I had been the project manager on is the Sandy River crossing, which is the lowest part in the, the pipeline alignment. And I was the project manager on that, that project. Um, much shorter, much less um, uh, uh, interface with the environment and with the community. Um, but still a big tunnel project. And then we take the water to Powell Butte, which are two uh, large underground reservoirs that are uh, basically on the very top of Powell Butte. And so we kind of bring the water by gravity to those locations. We also have the Columbia South Shore well field, which has a series of 35, 40 wells, and they are pumped up, 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 uphill to uh, Powell Butte. And that is basically, Powell Butte's basically the distribution point at which we, be, we begin to largely um, provide water to communities. So then we also have a Kelly Butte Reservoir, which has been recently uh, seismically upgraded. And then we, and then we bring the waters across the Willamette and and the project we're talking about tonight is the Willamette River Crossing, which will provide water from the seismically resilient Powell Butte or Kelly Butte, and they will bring it to the uh, the just recently computed completed uh, Washington Park reservoirs, which also have been seismically um, retrofits. So we have a pretty we're we're feeling like the big big pieces of the of this uh, the system have been uh, seismically retrofit. They're they're gonna managed to survive a big earthquake. And the last piece that we really need to tie the whole system together is to do the Willamette River crossing so that we can provide reliable water from the east side to the to the west side of the Willamette. So I think I'm going to hand it off to Nolan Furley at this point. Yes, thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks for that great background on, on the project and how we uh, get our water here in, in the Portland area. Um, and it's uh, nice to see everyone joined us tonight to, uh, to um, help uh, participate in, in understanding our project and helping us uh, communicate what we're looking to do. So I'll, I'll spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about uh, the proposed plan for the Willamette River crossing project, um, starting with this slide here. Um, with the river in the middle there, you can kind of see that the project's broken into uh, two sides or, or two uh, areas of, of the project. Um, on the east side, um, uh, we'll be connecting to the existing system and then bringing it underneath um, to the, the west side. Um, so on that map there, we have a couple um, blue lines that kind of show us uh, where we'll be working. Um, and as you can see, those, those blue lines um, are where we'll be at the surface um, uh, interacting with, with the environment there. Um, so the parts that connect those blue uh, areas are the sections that will either tie into existing facilities. Um, so existing water uh, pipes are where we'll be going underground um, to connect it. So, um, in, in a way, if, you're, if you kind of think about it, it's it's kind of like a uh, like sewing a, a thread with a needle, where um, we'll be at the surface for the exposed part, um, installing the, the the piece of thread, and then we dip underneath the, the piece of fabric to to uh, connect the, the other parts. So um, it's kind of a stitch work of, of construction methodologies, uh, but it's all uh, in place to bring water from the east side to the west side. Um, we have this uh, great uh, diagram here kind of showing the cross section of uh, downtown Portland there on, on the east side and, and showing the river with connecting to the west side. Um, we'll have uh, that orange section there with, with uh, your traditional open trench construction um, that will connect through a series of shafts there to cross underneath the, the rail. Um, right there, kind of near OMSI, um, is where we'll be launching our direct stable pipe machine. Um, it's, a, it's a type of tunneling that we'll, we'll, we'll cover here in a little bit. Uh, but that, that's the, the, the big part of the project here about making the, the crossing there. 
Um, and then where it comes into the River Place community, um, comes in uh, at South Waterfront Park there to a deep shaft. Um, and as you can see in that green uh, line there, it shows a micro tunnel. It's a different type of tunneling machine, very similar to the direct steerable pipe. Um, but that will go underneath a Montgomery to a, a service shaft there at Harbor, and then it basically connects into the, the west side um, supply that heads up to Washington Park that uh, Tim showed a little bit earlier there. So uh, just kind of where we're at on, on the schedule. At. Um, we've been working through design and, and doing some exploring. You've probably seen us out there uh, from time to time over the past year or so. Um, so we've completed uh, a definitive design uh, of, of the project um, that we're, you know, essentially 60%. Um, and uh, part of that uh, was our construction mitigation plan to communicate um, how we're going to go about um, building this project and, um, you know, how we're going to report to the community here. Um, so uh, during this design uh, phase, uh, we'll, we'll start getting into the construction. Um, um, so right now, uh, we'll be presenting as a project team to the city council in September. And then in the meantime, we'll, we'll be uh, continuing uh, public outreach um, and reporting through um, what we've heard uh, from the public and um, how we use that, that input into our, our planning and our design. Um, so uh, I'd like to, to introduce Katie Asher and turn over here to uh, talk through uh, a little bit more of these uh, outreach uh, goals and processes. Well, all right, thanks, Nolan. And thanks again to everybody for showing up tonight. I know I've spoken with a lot of different people who are on this call and I'll probably speak with others of you as the project moves forward. I just wanted to share a little bit with you about what we've been doing on this project in terms of community engagement. Um, both the Water Bureau and our construction, or as we call them, our design build team um, have been doing is making sure we have community engagement professionals working together to develop relationship with stakeholders and with the community in general. And also um, we've been working to actively engage the community since 2016. Um, I've only been on the team since 2019, but we know we've been, we've kind of built public involvement into this project since the beginning, because we understand it, you know, it's in the middle of the downtown core. It's gonna impact people on both sides of the river. And we wanna make sure people, one, know that it's happening, understand why it's important. And then also we can get feedback from people on what we can do to make the project more successful. So we've had dozens of one-on-one -on -one meetings. We've been to lots of neighborhood association meetings. Uh, we've hosted information sessions with businesses and, just in the last year, uh, we've attended the Downtown Neighborhood Association land use meetings. We've met with business associations on different sides of the river. We've also um, met with different folks from River Place Plan Community Association to provide them with briefings and um, hear feedback. We have a web page, we've done mailings, we send e-newsletters. We've been canvassing in person. We put out signage. <laughs> uh, we're really trying to cover our bases. What else? We met with the businesses and did some community surveys. Um, we had hosted an online open house with video and ASL, American Sign Language Technology. And you know, we've been using social media to try to reach people. Um, we're just really trying to cover our bases and make sure people know the project's happening. And they understand what it is. They understand how important it is. And you know, in this last phase of the project, you know, we we've we know we're gonna have some impacts in the neighborhood. So we've really been reaching out to people to say, what matters to you? Um, what are you concerned about? How can we answer your questions about that? And so part of tonight is really saying, you know, we've we've engaged with you and we've heard you and we've heard some of your priorities and we're here tonight to talk through, you know, our initial draft, our sort of draft plan for making sure we can limit some of those impacts. Um, our stakeholder mailing, mailing list is about 400 people uh, and, we say we think about 30% of those stakeholders have a business specific interest in the project. On the west side, our outreach is really focused on businesses impacted in the River Place area, as well as informing and hearing from residents. And we've had almost a dozen regular exchanges with the River Place Plan community, the Strand, the Vera, residents at Strand, and businesses at the Strand, the Vera, the Douglas, and River Place condos. Um, the feedback we receive from the community, whether it's from email, phone, on our website, has been carefully logged. We keep track of all the input we receive, and we've been tracking that as we consider our design and our 
our um, implementation strategies. So as you all have given us feedback about, well, I have a business, I need to know how I'm gonna get in. I'm concerned about noise, I'm concerned about traffic. We've been logging those concerns and trying to make sure that as we develop our plans going forward, that those concerns are reflected and that we're doing what we can to address some of those um, concerns and those impacts. And so you'll be hearing about that tonight, um, just in terms of, what we've heard you all say, these are our priorities based on the comments we've heard from all those different meetings we've had and how we're gonna address those. And so um, before we do that, I'm just gonna hand this back to Nolan. He's gonna talk a little bit more about those construction methods. He was talking about all kinds of tunneling. He has some pictures for you. <laughs> so um, check that out and then we'll get on to some of our mitigation strategies. Off to you, Nolan. Thanks, Katie. Um, okay, so yeah, construction, this is the fun stuff. We get to bring the, the toys out and, and, and build a you know, critical infrastructure for, for the city. And um, just kind of wanted to cover kind of two methodologies that, that we'll be employing um, on, a, on a very general level. Um, so you can see on the left side there on the open cut um, trenching there, that's your very standard typical um, you know, road construction to uh, install utilities um, uh, that I'm, I'm sure many have, have seen um, around the city or even outside of the city. Um, and then, uh, then we get into what we call trenchless uh, construction methodologies. Um, and what we have shown here are, are two of the, the big ones. Um, they're very similar um, in the type of machine, but a little bit different on how they operate in and are uh, implemented. So uh, you can see in the middle is a, is a micro tunnel there. Um, there is a, a cutting head on the front end um, and uh, it gets segmentally uh, advanced as it tunnels with a, a jacking frame that's towards the, the back there underneath that, that crane. Um, and then uh, the other one is the direct pipe. Direct pipe is a, a, um, a specialized uh, type of micro tunnel. Um, developed by a company in, in Germany. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's official name is a direct throw pipe thruster. Um, so it combines you know, micro tunneling with uh, this thruster. I kind of see towards the back of the picture there. Um, so instead of pushing from behind, it, it grabs the pipe uh, on the outside and, and it advances. Um, so this technology allows for a quick and cost effective uh, method of insulation in a one pass uh, tunneling operation. Um, and then um, I guess moving on to, to the next part there. Um, uh, with, with the, the open cut uh, parts there, um, we'll, we'll have uh, from, from the service there, um, uh, are, are gonna be tying in the points where we have our, our tunneling going from. Um, so you'll see some impacts um, from, from the two type of methods um, that uh, include uh, specifically with open cut there with uh, noise from trucks and, and moving materials around. Um, part of the, the impacts on that will be, you know, traffic, um, uh, detours um, and lane restrictions, uh, but we do so in order to uh, make sure that people uh, that are walking and biking or, or driving uh, move safely around our work zones. Um, and then on the west side where we'll have this open cut construction will be um, on the Harbor Drive there um, where it'll, it'll tie in from our tunnels. Um, the areas that will require the, the trench list um, over here on the west side, um, we'll be down there in the south uh, waterfront park. Um, so we'll use that direct pipe or direct sterile pipe thrusting uh, methodology to come into the pipe or uh, into the park underneath the river, uh, which is you know the most challenging part of this, this project is, is making that actual river crossing for the seismically resilient water line. Um, and then we'll receive that um, and transition into um, that micro tunnel we talked about. And I'll come up there on um, Montgomery Drive there. Um, so with that, uh, the, the tunneling is below surface, so that does limit the impact. Um, but we will uh, be working in those areas. Um, and so on the west side of the project, um, uh, 
we'll be uh, connecting those uh, two shafts there with a microtunnel um, and that machine will uh, mine uh, the material. Um, and as it mines out, we'll have material that comes uh, out of the shaft and uh, will be uh, taken out. Um, and then, um, yeah, move, moving forward there, we'll be um, um, using a, hold on a second here. So, so yeah, we're going to that, that work zone there. Um, so, so in order to to get that shaft in um, at Saltwater from Park, uh, kind of see that layout there with with uh, the orange zone. Uh, so um, it, it uses a portion of that park and, and not uh, quite the, the entire footprint, uh, mainly in that uh, open grass. If, as I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with that. Um, so the the shaft is uh, constructed with um, will be first constructed with a. Uh, a, a type of uh, drill rig that uh, allows us to install uh, secant pile shafts, which um, will will um, provide us uh, a safe working uh, in, uh, location there. Um, and then um, why this site has been uh, chosen is uh, over um, several years of, of, of going through and investigating this. Um, uh, and based on what we've heard from, from the community and our initial work, um, uh, we uh, identified this location uh, for completing the crossing alignment uh, due to um, how it ties in with, with the alignment of the pipe and providing a seismically resilient uh, pipeline. Uh, so some of the considerations with that location the hydraulics of the water system that we uh, talked about, again, east to west, um, how we can overall reduce the impact to our community um, from the uh, project as a whole, um, the make sure we have a earthquake uh, resilient um, pipeline uh, and, and how that plays in with the geological formations. And then the locations of structures and pipes, um, rail lines, uh, et cetera, on the east and west banks, um, as well as the piers of the Markham uh, Interstate 5 bridge. Um, the maintenance and shutdown requirements uh, require to, to be able to install this into the existing system, and then just uh, your general construction staging requirements. So. Um, we narrow down the, the river crossing location by the types and the composition of soil underneath the, the banks of the river and understanding from our understanding of how best to install this uh, earthquake resilient pipe uh, in these soils um, came to that. If we tell it from the east side of the river in a straight line um, right into downtown, uh, we'd run into a, a lot of these uh, objects that just kind of walk through there on the foundations of the River Place condominiums are, you know, underground piles that hold up the marina in place are, are these, uh, the Mark and Brist support. So uh, we have a, a complex geology in order to get to, to this part. So um, we also need to stay clear of some of the, the large uh, underground uh, storm facilities uh, that are west and north of River Place there. Um, and so to avoid all these obstacles, uh, the pipe uh, would need to take a, a sharp deflection if we were to do that straight, but that isn't in the, uh, in the realm of possibilities of, of, a, of a large pipe um, to, to make that kind of sharp angle. So instead, um, we'll be making that river crossing like we talked about with the direct steerable pipe, uh, stopping there at the waterfront part, um, and then switching over to that microtunnel machine um, to make the way up Montgomery. Then we'll put all the two pipes together there um, to make that river crossing and that micro tunnel section uh, tied together. Um, and after that's completed, uh, we'll uh, backfill that shaft and uh, replan and restore the park um, uh, after the, the pipeline components are completed. Um, and then with that re restoration of that park, uh, you know, beautiful award-winning park, um, it's about 20 years in, in its uh, current uh, configuration there. Um, so we are using the original drawings and plans from the South Waterfront Park um, that have been provided by the Portland Parks and Recreation Bureau. Um, we have a current inventory of what's in that park and uh, we are in the design process to help um, 
you know, restore that park as close as possible as, uh, as it is now and within uh, working with the parks and recreation to um, make sure it complies with their current and, and future plans for the park, um, uh, along with having their involvement on, on sign off on our restoration um, before um, the work is considered complete. So uh, Montgomery Shaft here, um, a quick picture of, of uh, Shaft being constructed there um, on, a, on a similar type of uh, project there. Um, that, that one's only about 20 feet deep. So we're, we're gonna be going uh, much deeper in order to um, uh, make this crossing. So at this location, that the, the shaft is uh, where we'll lower, lower the microtunnel machine to a depth to about 90 feet below the ground uh, before we start um, tunneling under uh, Montgomery Street uh, up to a shaft that's located in South Harbor. Uh, this will also be the, like I said, the location where the direct pipe boring machine will arrive after the crossing, um, uh, after the river crossing there. So activities in the park um, uh, would include removing soil and fortifying the shaft, as well as receiving and launching the tunnel machines um, the shaft will be backfilled, uh, like I said, after the, the pipe uh, operations are uh, fully installed. Um, we are targeting to begin work on the shaft in early 2023. Uh, shaft installation during the start of the project will last in the three to six month range and will likely be the most noisy and disruptive portion of this project, uh, in part to the, the drilling of the, the shaft structure itself along with the trucks moving uh, soil in and out of the, the area. The microtunnel operation will, will take place um, after the shaft and the park is completed. Um, has an anticipated start uh, in uh, mid to late 2023 there. Uh, installing a pipe um, in the microtunnel will reduce the impact to South Montgomery Street and uh, keep it open for, for traffic and uh, deliveries and, and parking along uh, the north side there. Um, this is a, a longer operation. Um, we have estimated that the microtunnel operation will take nine, 12 months uh, to complete. Um, and and uh, as, as discussed briefly, uh, we'll have a different set of construction equipment with the microtunnel and thruster being used uh, underground uh, inside the, the deep shaft. So uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll be working in that area. Uh, we, we're looking to get out there um, uh, early 2023 to start start working and uh, continue generally for about two years. So construction hours, um, you know, the pretty standard construction hours. Uh, uh, Cruise will mainly works 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Monday through Friday. And uh, we typically uh, don't work during major holidays um, from work, uh, for work that coincides with uh, events in the area. Uh, we'll definitely be uh, working with stakeholders and uh, with the Portland Parks and Recreation event staff or other, um, other businesses and, and stakeholders to help minimize our impacts. Uh, recently, we're out there doing uh, some uh, testing of the soil along uh, Montgomery. Uh, during the, the jazz festival was held, held here at the beginning of the month. And, um, you know, we worked with uh, the parks department and understanding that festival and, and the traffic impacts and um, made sure that we were able to get that information uh, for the project design while still letting uh, events like that go on and also letting businesses um, be able to continue to operate um, along with um, making sure we weren't blocking uh, uh, driveways. Um, so uh, for the construction hours here, we'll be up, um, applying for all the, the proper permits uh, with the city to perform work at night um, to uh, minimize uh, traffic impacts. Um, so, so this is a limited amount of night work that the project team has, best is, um, has identified that would be best to limit the impact overall to the community. Um, so this would also be your standard Monday through Friday. There, there's a possibility of some weekend work with that. And um, what, th what this mainly is for is that Harbor Drive reception shaft, which is um, almost smack dab there in the middle of the intersection of uh, Harbor Drive and um, Montgomery. 
Um, so in, in order to reduce that, that traffic impact, um, we'll be looking at activities um, at night that is um, uh, beneficial overall. Uh, so night work uh, for, for that shaft uh, would probably last about two months uh, to get that fully installed. Um, fairly uh, a deep shaft, not as deep as the one at, at uh, the park there, but uh, still deep and it'll take some time to get in. Um, this is uh, expected to uh, take place uh, mid to late 2023 after the um, west side open cut section um, and microtunnel pipe installation is completed. Uh, we'll have about another month of night work um, uh, in front of us in order to connect the pipe to that open cut section and that uh, microtunnel section and to uh, backfill and restore the, the, the road pavement and, um, and uh, the curb and gutter around there. Uh, so uh, like I said, when, when we work at night, uh, we'll definitely be working within the city's uh, noise office to make sure uh, we meet city standards for our, our noise variance uh, permits. Um, and this uh, will also include a requirement for a 24 hour uh, hotline uh, for, for people to um, be able to utilize. So uh, getting into the more specific construction impacts there, um, spent some time talking about that uh, and, and what we've heard um, from many of these conversations and outreaches uh, that um, we've been talking about here over the, the past uh, really uh, handful of years. And, um, and what we've heard is you know, most important to the community, um, you know, includes traffic and access, noise and vibration, dust and, and air quality, uh, site safety and, and security and, and staging and hall routes. Um, I'd also like to talk through uh, how we address these concerns and our mitigation plans to uh, help minimize these uh, impacts to the community. Um, it's important to note that the project is two years in duration uh, for the construction activities. Um, and while it'll be happening in different uh, segments at um, uh, different times, um, it will help limit the impact to, to different locations, uh, specifically there on the, the west side. Um, we will be working in you know, these areas um, for a few weeks or, or months at a time, followed by periods where uh, we'll be working uh, elsewhere on the project. Um, uh, so uh, you, you'll certainly see us out there at, at that, that site um, uh, in our, our traffic and, and um, detours and, and some of the noise and other packs will, will vary over the, the project's timeline. Um, um, but uh, overall, you know, we're, we're trying to um, be the best neighbors that we possibly can be to, to come in and, and um, complete the work and, and, uh, and uh, move on to the next one. So getting into traffic and uh, access here, um, you know, I, I think this is the one of the biggest ones um, that that we usually get asked uh, first when dealing with uh, utilities and installing them in, in and under underneath the roadways, uh, and specifically with vehicle and pedestrian and bikes uh, during construction. So our plan is to minimize these disruptions uh, to um, access as much as possible using a variety of means, uh, including uh, our detours, our partial closures, uh, instead of full, full closures where possible. We will also uh, return uh, traffic patterns to normal and release parking restrictions at night. Um, and during longer periods of time that, that we are not actively working uh, in order to, to minimize that, that impact. Um, specifically on pedestrians, um, uh, Around the, the park, uh, the the pathway um, along the waterfront there will will be maintained open, um, but we will be detouring uh, in some areas to maintain safety in and around the work zone. Uh, when this happens, signage and fencing will um, safely direct pedestrians to an alternate route. Uh, some examples of detours would be on the south side there of the traffic uh, circle at uh, Montgomery and South uh, River Drive there. Um, and um, perhaps um, most significantly there on, on the north and east side of the roundabout, um, that will be closed uh, uh, in the detour uh, along that path, uh, either 
to the to the west um, on the south side of traffic server or, or around the the um, the path that ties into the esplanade there. Um, so this uh, these detours will be implemented when um, we're out and about there um, over the course of, of the two, two years. So um, uh, we're, we're looking to minimize that impact, but, but still provide uh, pedestrians able to to walk to uh, uh, the different uh, areas they're, they're trying to get to and and um, and we'll work um, to make sure they get there safely. Uh, bikes and uh, people using assistive devices uh, uh, where it's needed will install temporary ramps or still plates to accommodate access for people uh, using wheelchairs in and around the construction um, uh, activity areas where there isn't one ramps already existing. Um, uh, there's uh, potential for some bike closures on South Montgomery. Uh, but it will have a detour in order to ensure safety um, to, to get around the, the work site. Um, and these closures will take, while they take place, we'll make sure, like I said, we'll make sure to detour um, the route and, and have it posted. Um, access to business, um, our, our intention is to make sure that um, all businesses have access to, uh, to deliveries. I've heard from a number of businesses that and um, that the roundabout is used, and I, I've seen it firsthand out, out there, as far as a, a loading zone um, to to load in on load goods and and for people to be dropped off with access to to that park there. Um, because um, and we'll get into a little bit uh, into more detail here, but because of access on the east side of the roundabout will be uh, limited. Um, We'll be working with uh, the businesses to make sure that um, uh, loading and unloading goods can continue to happen uninterrupted, uh, uh, but in a slightly different location. This will most likely be on South Montgomery, just west of the traffic circle, where uh, some of the, of the deliveries and, and loading zone already exist. Um, there may be times when uh, the loading area locations Will need to be shifted, uh, but we'll work to communicate with business owners in the area to determine uh, suitable alternatives that work for all parties involved. Uh, signs will be placed in strategic locations to direct pedestrian traffic to businesses in this area, uh, and we'll continue to work with the business community in, in the area to determine locations and content for signing to best communicate that. Uh, parking, um, so limited parking restrictions uh, overall. Um, but some will be necessary, uh, including um, at the roundabout is, is primarily where it's at. There, I mean, there's three or four, four spots there on the uh, east side uh, of the traffic circle. So those will be uh, closed during construction hours um, uh, to the site, um, but will be available um, um, after when, when we're not all working in that area. Um, continuing down with traffic here and getting into vehicle access, um, emergency vehicles uh, access will, will always remain and, and have access uh, throughout the project and we'll be sure to coordinate that. Um, um, most recently we're down there doing some, some soil sampling. Um, uh, I think I counted four or five uh, fire trucks that came through um, um, with, without having uh, any uh, issues at all getting through there. So um, definitely make sure we'll, we'll have that kind of access. Um, although uh, we'll do our best to, to limit traffic flows, we do anticipate that access uh, through Montgomery uh, roundabout will be will have to be affected. Construction of our rec uh, reception shaft and launch pits, um, as well as the trenches installation of the pipe uh, require the use of that Eastern half of the roundabout. We we're talking about a little bit there. Uh, well, that will be closed during construction um, hours. Um, we've uh, had some service surveys of the businesses in this area to help us get a sense of, of what the delivery schedules are. And as we know that the roundabout is, is like I said, used um, as a drop-off point um, for uh, multiple people and businesses. Um, we'll, we'll continue to, to work on getting a plan together that, that works for all, all parties involved on, on that. Um, um, so that people can get to where, where they need to be. So with traffic and, and construction uh, equipment, uh, noise uh, is uh, uh, something that 
is definitely a, a part of of building work and and, and being uh, in a, in a big city. Um, so there are some activities on the west side that we expect to generate more noise than, than others. Um, the these include the drilling of the seekin piles, um, which we talked about was this, the structure of that shaft that make up the walls um, for the the two tunneling machines to come in and, and out of. Uh, for our workers to work safely uh, for the installation of that. Um, so the, the equipment that helps us separate liquids from solids when we're tunneling um, with the microtunnel machine, um, along with some other support equipment for that work. And then, um, of course, you know, night work on, on, on South Harbor Drive there um, out, towards, uh, out towards the Block J parking lot area. Uh, that we, we talked about a little bit uh, earlier. Um, although uh, there will be noise associated with the project, uh, we want to let you know that uh, we will work with the, the city's uh, noise program throughout the project, uh, work within um, the, the applicable uh, noise regulations during the day and at night. And uh, we want to let you know uh, kind of what that means. Um, so for the start, uh, we'll be sending notifications about noise. Um, that includes uh, how to contact a 24 hot, lo hot uh, line if uh, you need to file a, a complaint and bring up um, uh, anything that, that we need to be made aware of so we can uh, work through that. So when uh, complaints are made, uh, uh, we'll provide steps on, on how we're uh, gonna take that information and address it and try and resolve it as, as best as possible um, while still being able to perform the work. Um, so, so based on the feedback, um, some of the mitigation measures that we're looking to implement to help keep noise impacts to a minimum, um, we'll be starting with uh, installing a fence around the South Waterfront uh, work zone um, that will help us dampen sound from the site. Uh, the specifics of this wall have not yet to be determined, but uh, anticipate a seven to eight foot high uh, uh, fence around the site's perimeter will be constructed, you know, either with a, a vinyl wall or, or wood um, type of material uh, that we anticipate decorating um, with an art mural, kind of what we see here on, on that picture um, to the, the left of that slide, um, and and look to have a noise damping material um, attached to it uh, to help reduce um, noise uh, um, from within the fence. Uh, We'll conduct a background noise study, um, just part of our, our permitting to um, understand the, the current uh, baseline noise levels in the area uh, to be used um, um, with anything, you know, uh, noise varies throughout the day. Um, uh, starting off early with, with a lot of the deliveries there in the area and the different businesses getting uh, their storefronts uh, neat and tidy uh, and just the general public use uh, throughout the day. Uh, for people going to and, and from work and, and in use of the, the park and then the facilities around it. Um, we'll explore uh, using the possibility of, of using a sound noise observing um, material around the machine engines, uh, pumps and, and generators to help um, reduce that sound at, at its source. Um, if possible, uh, we're looking to get uh, utilize uh, power drops uh, from the power companies um, in order to reduce the amount of, of generation um, from uh, power generation from, from diesel generators um, uh, to run the, the equipment in order to perform the work. Um, we have and, and will implement a five minute uh, idle uh, policy on equipment uh, and vehicles that are not in use during construction in order to reduce the noise from the equipment. Um, and with that, um, more on, on the environmental side there, you know, the, the equipment will be uh, EPA compliant uh, with the exhaust and the muffling of it. And then um, a lot of times backup alarms are used on, on vehicles and construction equipment, and, and those will utilize a white noise uh, backup alarm instead of um, on the more standard um, loud uh, beeping alarm. And then uh, throughout the process, we'll, we'll be sure to monitor and record the noise levels uh, around the site um, while performing the work. 
And so the, the city code allows for uh, 85 decibels um, at a range of 50, measure at a range of 50 feet during the day between uh, seven and six. Um, it's kind of comparable to uh, a loud uh, lawnmower. Um, a little bit louder would be a pressure washer or, or um, uh, loud applause at, a, at, a, at an event or, or even um, uh, rush hour traffic is kind of what, what that range is at. Uh, so we, like I said, we do, um, uh, plan to uh, be applying for all the applicable permits uh, with the cities to do um, do that work um, at night. That would be, um, you know, monitored by by those regulations on sound. Um, um, this will be done to limit um, again uh, our limit our impact on, on traffic there um, on Harbor Drive in Montgomery in, in order to get that that shaft in. So that, that's where that would be um, there for the, the night work. So. Um, during these uh, night uh, work periods, uh, we'll continue to use, uh, mod like I said, modified backup uh, alarms there. Um, and we'll be sure to be providing notice of these night work activities in advance. And we'll work with the community to uh, mitigate uh, disruptions as, as much as possible. Um, we'll be doing some settlement monitoring um, um, that will occur. Um, uh, with our, our survey equipment at, at, at different locations, um, um, but that's that's a very uh, a minimal um, impact and um, uh, as far as uh, sound goes. Uh, but we'll we'll definitely be providing uh, more information about that in our in some of our background material that, that we'll, we'll be sharing um, later this evening and, and throughout the project. Uh, dust and air quality. Um, it's a it's a big thing that that we uh, we paid attention to, and it's something we've heard uh, a lot um, from y'all on on your concerns around the project. So we appreciate that feedback. Um, the city of Portland has uh, detailed standards um, on to make sure that construction sites minimize dust, and and we'll make sure we'll follow those rules. In addition to that, um, spend the next couple of minutes here talking through uh, some additional ways we plan to minimize dust and construction related to air quality impacts. So uh, we will uh, monitor dust debris and other materials that are tracked, uh, potentially tracked that are emitted by construction equipment. Um, you know, uh, that all starts with maintaining a, a clean and tidy job site. Um, and we'll uh, establish a visual air monitoring program um, to provide provisions to ensure that dust debris and material uh, and, and trash don't become airborne and, and travel off, off the project. Um, we we'll conduct dust control activities in, in the work uh, area nearby um, uh, that you know help uh, sweep up uh, potentially tracked material be before it, um, uh, it becomes a nuisance. Uh, establish um, construction entrances uh, from that park area, and that helps with the removal of, of, of dirt and, and mud and debris from construction equipment tires. Uh, and if um, some of that does uh, get out of sight, we'll, we'll be um, street, uh, sweeping the streets uh, um, around our work area and the nearby streets in order to address that. And, and again, to keep things nice and neat. Um, and then we'll provide ongoing uh, driver education um, about our best practices to minimize deaths, such as using a tarp over uh, truckloads. Um, and then, um, if, if that's uh, where we identify stuff that, that needs to be uh, looked at a little bit more, um, we'll modify or, or stop that dust cut and cause the activity uh, in order to make sure um, we are being uh, good neighbors and meeting the standards and expectations that, that are set before us. Uh, in regards to air quality, um, a lot of it's related to, to dust in many ways, uh, but it's also impacted by the type of engines that we use and, and equipment in order to build this large uh, critical infrastructure. Um, we utilize equipment that, that meets uh, EPA's tier four emission standards uh, when possible. Um, and diesel generators are equipped with emission control technologies, um, uh, typically uh, um, scrubbers uh, on the, the exhaust there. Uh, to provide a, a better um, overall uh, air quality. In addition, um, we'll explore using uh, power drops um, if if that makes uh, if it's feasible there. Um, like we talked about for for reducing the amount of 
uh, diesel generators uh, needed to, to run the site there. Um, again, minimizing idling during, um, during work with that five minute idle rule and a, a visual uh, air monitoring system that we put in place um, with our field management responsible for conducting uh, regular assessments of that. Um, so site safety and, and security and, and kind of with that, and just uh, lighting. Um, uh, so we understand that, you know, safety, security, and aesthetics are, are very important to you and safety is, you know, number one for us um, in making sure our people go home um, as good, if not better than when they come to work each day. So uh, we pride ourselves on, on a clean, safe, and secure work sites. Um, and around this site, you know, that includes, you know, fencing and lighting. Um, uh, lighting uh, is, is very important um, for construction activities to make sure we have a, a a well lit uh, uh, construction zone during the, the darker um, light. Right right now we have this great um, uh, sunlight through to you know early in the morning to late at night. Uh, but when we get into those winter months, it, it gets darker um, quicker. And then for those uh, night activities, uh, we utilize uh, some some uh, light plants there um, in order to uh, uh, illuminate our work and, and make a, a safe work environment for both our crews and for the the traveling public. So construction lighting will, will be used, but will be limited to our work hours, um, you know, including that nighttime work when applicable. Uh, lighting will be limited only to the project areas that require it to be maintained for safety for the crew and community uh, requiring access uh, into and around the site. Um, um, not as applicable at this location, but uh, we uh, often um, implement uh, motion activated lighting um, at the entrances of our trailers um, on site. So it allows for safe entrance and exit. And then um, as much as possible, all re uh, lighting related to construction activities will be uh, shielded or, or directed to the work uh, area in order to uh, restrict the direct illumination onto properties located um, outside the, the work area. Uh, and then with fencing, uh, you know, as part of our security measures there, um, talk through, uh, you know, chain link or uh, wood panel type mesh uh, fencing that'll be used around the perimeter of the work site. Um, there'll be some utilized uh, over near um, Harbor Drive. And then uh, currently we have some up in uh, Block J there on, on the, the parking lot there, just west of, of the river um, front community there. Um, in order to uh, secure the, the work zone. Um, and then uh, as we kind of talked about the, or highlighted the, the sound barrier um, uh, will be utilized in tandem with, with that fencing to help um, um, mitigate sound there um, emanating uh, from that South Waterfront Park. Um, and then more information about um, possible sound barriers are, are reducing, um, uh, material, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be sharing that as we get closer to construction and, and um, finalize our designs on, on that. So staging haul routes, um, you know, we need to get materials to and, and from the, the site. Um, so uh, talking through some of that here um, on the west side specifically, um, um, we know you have concerns about trucks. Um, and, and the potential for them for blocking access to residences or, or businesses. So I, I wanted to address that first in this, and um, we, we will not uh, be blocking uh, driveways. And, and as stated, we'll be working to make sure that uh, we can uh, get uh, all the deliveries um, um, to where, where they need to be. So our, our trucks will typically come off a of Harbor Drive, like most uh, delivery trucks in that, that area uh, currently do. Um, there is potential for something to be staged there towards uh, Harbor Way, um, and um, so stage them so they're not um, um, uh, in the, the area there around the, the traffic circle in order to, to minimize um, the flow of traffic there. Um, so uh, when they're staged over there, they'll proceed down Montgomery, um, drop up or pick up a load of, of the material that um, they're either bringing or taking, uh, and then exit the area. Um, there, there isn't much uh, storage down there, so there's really going to be a, a truck or two at a time um, um, as they go. Uh, we'll work on uh, making sure our 
trucks are, are staged in such a way that um, there isn't uh, multiple trucks uh, sitting there um, uh, during um, operations such as uh, excavation. So um, a cycle like this will continue for the, the different operations that will be going on down there um, at the, the waterfront park. Um, and um, and they'll, they'll uh, eventually taper off there um, once once that shaft is is constructed. Um, so um, again, I just want to highlight that um, you know we'll have the, the dedicated staging areas for that, um, and um, and we will not be blocking driveways and, and make sure that people are able to to get to the different um, uh, parking lots and, and access their their homes and businesses. Um, while it's not possible to know the exact number of trucks um, that we'll, we'll be utilizing for uh, this operation. Um, and, and really until we, we have some of our subcontractors um, um, selected and, and hired to, to do some of this work, um, um, you know, the, it's gonna be a, a moving target. Um, however, uh, you know, uh, over the, the first six months, um, a, a good estimate will be about 800 truck trips so that does kind of sound like a lot, um, but it equates to about six to eight trucks making uh, three trips a day. So doing the rough math, you know, it's about 18 to 24 uh, truck trips a, a day. Um, I, again, with, with that being, the, you know, getting um, the, the shaft constructed, and once that's in, um, it'll um, greatly uh, reduce from, from there um, once we're, we're in, in the uh, tunneling uh, section. Um, and then um, there'll, there'll be some tapered uh, activity ramp back up when we're looking to backfill that shaft towards the end of the job. So um, as we talked about, uh, touched on quickly, uh, we'll plan on using the grass area up there by Harbor Drive and Harbor Way, um, uh, mainly for the construction of the Harbor shaft there, that reception shaft, um, in order to minimize the amount of equipment moving around. Um, and then uh, during periods of this um, construction there on the west side, uh, we'll be tying into, uh, again, what we call Block J, which is that uh, blue uh, shaded area up there in that parking lot between NATO Parkway and South Harbor Drive um, in order to, to do some of the work. Um, so uh, that, that's what we'll be doing that. Um, the north uh, staircase there, um, it's been recently open uh, with, um, PBOT's uh, NATO Parkway project being completed. Um, so we intend to keep that open um, throughout throughout the job uh, and um, uh, unless something requires that, that to be temporarily um, detoured uh, for, for safety. Um, crews, uh, again, once we're, well, that, you know, some of these staging areas, uh, once we're done with them, uh, we'll be restoring the areas um, after construction is complete. Uh, and I'm gonna share everyone's a little tired of me talking. So, so uh, Katie's gonna spend a few minutes here talking about how we're gonna communicate um, our, our coordination of, of communication. Katie. Okay, hey, thanks Nolan. So, um, you know, one of the things we've heard a lot from neighbors are just questions about, well, how, you know, are you coordinating with the, the builders who are planning to build at the Douglas? Are you, are you talking to parks? Who are you, you know, who are you working with? And um, we wanted to let you know, we are committed, we, we know this project will only succeed if we can successfully coordinate with all the different bureaus we need to. Um, and so we've been working with, with our, our team members, but also with other city bureaus, with state agencies, uh, with businesses in the area. And our hope is that this coordination will minimize impacts to you and um, as area business residents and owners. So we attend regular meetings with Portland's Parks Department and Transportation Department to coordinate our, our work in the area near Southwest NATO Parkway. And we're gonna continue working with Portland Parks and Recreation as we shift our location of our work from up near NATO to, to the South Waterfront Park. Um, we meet with them monthly and we'll continue talking to them. You know, We have a lot of overlap there. We'll be working in a park, so we need to work with them. Um, we and as Nolan mentioned, you know, we've been working with them all along, and so we know who to talk to if we want to know we don't want to disrupt events in the park, or you know, how do we want to restore the park? Who do we talk to about that? We so we've been talking to their different staff about those things. Um, we also have a liaison with the Bureau of Development Services, 
and they're helping us navigate the sort of this is complex land use and permitting issues that come with having a project of this size. So we meet with them on a regular basis and that's sort of helping us make sure that he can bring in other permitting folks as needed and help us move our project through the city system. Uh, we participate in some regional construction coordination meetings so that other agencies, not just the city, but beyond the city and beyond know about our work and what, you know, what, you know, like if we're working on South Harbor Drive, we'll want to make sure people know that and that we're coordinating with all the different agencies in the area so that um, we can, we can minimize any sort of conflict of, you know, conflict or uses, use conflicts um, get out of the way for folks. Um, we also, you know, we have been meeting with the folks from certain folks on the east side, as well as with the people who are working on the Douglas redevelopment. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings with them. Right now, you know, we're all in the phase where we're developing and working on permitting. So there's, you know, we, we don't control who gets permitted first, but we are talking to them and talk, we'll be continue talking to them if we're gonna be working in and around each other, just because, you know, they, they are two big projects. And so um, we're definitely, have, we have connection with them and we're, we're keeping tabs on their close tabs on their project to make sure that we know what's happening as we move along. We also, you know, want to make sure that you all have the um, information you need to ask questions and you know who to contact with issues as they arise. Um, we have a short list that I'm sharing with you tonight. This information will be on our web page. This actually points you to our website, but um, <laughs> we will have more information as we get closer to construction. We're working out, we've been talking with um, Brent from the River Place Plan community a little bit. And he's like, you know, it'd be helpful if you had some sort of phone tree or way to understand who to call if you have specific questions about certain parts. And so, um, you know, we're still in this design phase, but that's definitely one of our tasks for this phase is to work on this, uh, like a, a who to call with what kind of questions, when type thing. So we're, that's something that's on our list and something we're working towards. Um, so like I said, that information that you're seeing right now and then the next slide, um, it will be on the web page and, and this presentation will be up there later as well. So you can watch and look for that information. Um, yeah, so, you know, we have some ideas about who, you know, who do I call if it's during the day in construction and I need to get to my business or who do I call if I have a noise complaint during the day? What happens if it's night and I have noise complaint? We don't have a noise permit at this time. So there's no phone to call. We're not even working at night, but when we do, there'll be a phone number. Um, and just so you know, just for general, questions in general, something good to know is that the Water Bureau does have a 24-7 dispatch line um, for water emergencies. Um, it's up on the screen, but that's something you just keep in your back pocket. If you're having a water emergency, like, oh, the water's gushing out of the street. It's not the water, it's not the Willamette River Crossing project, but something's happening here. We have a phone number for that. So we'll continue to develop this and make sure all that information is available on our website and that, you know, we're communicating with different community folks who were who are helping to triage um, to make sure people know who to call and how to reach us. All right, and so, yeah, we're, we're nearing the end of our talking part, but so we wanna know, we of course always wanna make the pitch, please stay involved. We'd love for you to sign up for our regular email updates. Um, we'd love for you to visit the project webpage. We have an FAQ up there where we've answered some other questions that aren't related to construction impacts in detail. So if you're wondering, well, how are you going to construct this? Or how is this going to work? Um, or why are you why are you doing this here or there? We've had some of that. We've had people ask those questions and we posted that on our project webpage. Um, and I think that Lauren is posting that information to the chat for everybody. So if you want to copy and paste or click on those links, you have that information at your fingertips. And so we've got some final polling questions for you now before we move into Q&A so we can all kind of get move out of our um, I'm shaking off my listening, sitting and listening, and now we can move into a poll and move into the more interactive portion of the uh, presentation. So back to Lauren, our, our poll yep. queen. The poll queen, here she is. Um, so this next poll question will help us to get a sense of what the communication preferences are. Um, as Katie mentioned, there's a variety of ways that will that will continue to keep you informed. And we just, through this question, want to make sure um, that that works for you. So the question is, how would you like to receive construction information, um, email and website updates, uh, flyers at my door, meetings, briefings? These are multiple choice. You can choose all three. Um, again, we'll continue to, to reach out to you through a variety of ways, mailings, e-newsletters, 
social media postings. And um, we're getting a strong response on email and website updates. It's good meetings. People still like those. Um, we'll definitely be having virtual meetings and maybe in person. Um, and folks still like to receive notices at their door. That's great. Thank you for your feedback. There's the results there. Email and website updates is a strong winner, but again, we'll continue to use multiple forms of communication. Um, and then our last and final polling question before we move into the Q&A session. Um, did this presentation, has it provided the right amount of information or enough information? Um, be completely honest with us. Uh, that's why we're here. And we do have our Q&A session right after this polling question. It's about a 50 split between not really and yes or not sure. Got a few more people if they want to respond to this question. All right, so a quarter of folks are getting the right amount of information and the rest are not. So we'll move. Thank you for thank you for that feedback and we'll move into the Q&A session uh, next year. Um, we've been getting some, you know, great, great engagement and questions and comments coming in since we started the presentation. Uh, the project team on the back end has responded to a few of those um, as we were going along. And so we invite you to continue to um, ask questions, leave comments in that Q&A tool. And I am going to tee up these questions that we've gotten. Um, we are going to address them by topic as, as best as we can. Um, and the topics are um, organized by, uh, we've got fact sheets on the website and we linked you to those in the chat. So we'll take them by topic and we're also very flexible. So if we get questions out of topic, um, we'll work on addressing those as well. Um, as it's been mentioned tonight, the focus is on construction impacts, construction activities, and uh, the mitigation plan. So we're going to stick to responding to those, those questions. If there's anything outside of that um, that you really would like more information on, we do encourage you to reach out to the project team. All right, so we are going to start with um, the topic of traffic and access. Um, our first question here, I'm going to address from Elizabeth Oaks. Elizabeth, thank you for your question. Um, you are asking, can we walk along the riverfront to the marina, to the hotel and restaurants? You said it wasn't really clear in the presentation. Um, so I will kick that over to Nolan to see if you can address that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, th thanks, Elizabeth, for the, the question. And, um... Uh, the, so the, the answer is yes, um, there will be uh, access to walk along the, the riverfront there, uh, down to the marina and, and uh, to the hotel and restaurants. Um, uh, so I, I apologize for not making that uh, as clear, uh, but the, the intent is to have a continuous access there from um, Poet Beach all the way up through uh, Tom McCall Park there. Um, the construction fencing will, will be basically up, up to the edge of that, um, that paved walkway there. Thanks, Nolan. Um, another access question from Catherine Skinner just came in, so I'm gonna touch on that one right now. Will the marina also be accessible? Yes, yes, yeah, that, that will be uh, accessible at all times um, there. Um, um, for, for being able to walk down to it. And then uh, I, I know people uh, load and unload stuff and, and that's where that uh, zone to the um, 
west of the traffic circle will, will be uh, utilized and, and coordinated there. All right, thanks, Nolan. Um, we'll take another traffic and access question here. Uh, will you be working evenings and nights at the Montgomery Shaft area or just up at Harbor Drive? Lauren, can, can you repeat that one? The question is, will you be working evenings or nights at the Montgomery Shaft area or yeah. just up at Harbor Drive? So Harbor Drive and along Montgomery where the shaft will be. Yeah, so, so that, that work will, will, the night work will be up in the, um, the exit shaft um, location there for the microtunnel at Harbor and uh, Harbor or uh, Montgomery Drive. Um, around the, the shaft itself, um, there's no um, planned uh, construction activities like large structure activities. Um, there will be part of that, the shaft construction, uh, a, um, a process that, that we uh, have pumps to keep the, the surface, um, uh, the bottom of the surface uh, dry while we are working there. Um, so there, there could be a, a person stopping by to make sure that those are, are still running. Um, but as far as uh, big construction activities, we, we are not planning to work in the park at night. All right, thank you, Nolan. Uh, what is meant by, so this is a traffic and access question. What is meant by South Lane on Harbor Drive being closed? Will we no longer have access to our homes from downtown via South on Harbor Drive and turning left onto Montgomery? So that's a real technical one. Um, yeah, I think I think I have the answer for that though. Um, okay. So uh, as the microtunnel exits from uh, its its drive there into that, that shaft there at Harbor, it will tie into the open cut. Um, uh, so that will be dug from the surface that then ties into the what's called the west side header um, that you know helps it get up to Washington Park there. Um, so that alignment will be within the turn lane that goes southbound um, onto Montgomery. Um, the traffic will will be uh, reconfigured when that work is, is being done in order to take that um, that uh, left hand turn. Um, there will at times be a detour that takes you down um, uh, one block to the south there, um, Harrison and River Parkway, I, I believe it is, to kind of you know go go around the the other way there, uh, in in order to access um, the the riverfront community there. Um, the the shaft uh, when it's constructed, um, it will have a um, it will be plated over with street plates um, to allow um, traffic to obviously drive over over that. Um, and and same with the um, the um, open cut work, um, you know, when that is 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 in the process of being constructed. Um, so uh, there, are, you know, when those are not being uh, worked on and they're plated over, um, access to make that left turn uh, right there at Montgomery. Uh, will will still be allowable, uh, but at, at times there will be detours to to go down to the next um, area and, and work your way into the community. All right, thank you for that response. Um, there's another one uh, from Joseph. Where are the construction workers going to park? Will they compete with business patrons? Uh, th thanks for the question. Uh, so. Uh, our, our goal is not not to have that uh, a competition there. Although uh, there'll be limited parking uh, in that um, the the South Waterfront Park for um, a, a truck or, or two, we will utilize um, the north end of the parking lot up there at Block J, uh, where um, that shaft is is currently at, and uh, we'll also have a um, staging yard over. On the east side of the river, where uh, crews will, will mainly park, and um, they'll, they'll pile into a crew truck in, in the morning and, and make their way in there, uh, in order to um, minimize the amount of vehicles and you know the limited amount of parking down there. All right, thank you, Nolan. Um, this one is from anonymous. Um, are the dump trucks moving up and down Montgomery? or out along River Drive? 
the, the way it's set up right now, um, they'll, they'll be moving up uh, Montgomery, um, just the, the way we'll be utilizing the, the traffic server will come out of the park. Um, so, so they'll be heading that way. And then uh, depending on, on where that material needs to go, they'll either be heading you know, I-5 south or, or working their way down NATO in, in order to, to head out east, potentially. So this is Katie. So Nolan, to clarify, they'll just be going back and forth on Montgomery in and out of the neighborhood. They won't be making that big loop through the neighborhood going Montgomery to River Place to River Parkway. Just no. Like for, a lollipop shape. <laughs> yeah, I guess a lollipop is, is a good uh, um, description there. Oh uh, yeah, for, for the most part, utilizing Montgomery. Um, I, you know, sometimes, uh, Sometimes uh, you, uh, you know, Chuck or Chew might, might uh, use a, a different route, but um, uh, yeah, that, that is our plan to make, you know, a straight um, limited amount of uh, a pathway as, as possible there for, for trucks. And, uh, you know, the trucks would be similar to a lot of the, the delivery uh, trucks um, that are, are in that area right now. All right, thank you, Nolan and Katie. Um, this next question is from Diana Stewart. And Diana, you did ask a few questions, which is great. And I'm still keeping to uh, topics, so I'll get to them um, eventually, but it may not be all, all at once. Um, the question is, what is the mitigation plan so businesses don't go bankrupt from people avoiding this area for two years? Um, I know in the presentation, there's there was talk about uh, signage and staying communicated communicated with the um, community. Nolan, is there anything else uh, you'd like to add? Yeah, that that's definitely um, uh, a complex uh, question there. Um, but our uh, like you mentioned, you know, we'll we'll be working with with businesses in order to make sure people can, can get to the, the areas that they're they're trying to get to um, and um, you know make sure that our activities in order to build this critical infrastructure um, is as limited as, as possible as, as far as impacts to, to the area while recognizing that it, it can't be absolutely zero without um, getting something in there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Diana. Um, this next question is from Elizabeth Oaks. Um, Elizabeth says she doesn't understand why um, to choose such a high density, much loved public area to stage. I'm assuming she's speaking about um, South Water Waterfront Park roundabout area, but um, Elizabeth, please do correct me if that's not accurate. Uh, yeah, so um, as, as far as the al alignment um, and it, staging, I, I guess, has uh, definitely implications um, to, to perform that work in order to provide the project's um, greatest chance of, of making it, you know, across the, the river with a, a complex drill path um, and within the, the project limits and the, the physical barriers and geological strata um, that, that we are um, working within and designing around. Um, uh, and some of the, the uh, things we, we talked through on, on what went into kind of, uh, yeah, or what did go into choosing that location on uh, multiple alignments um, was a site that we saw that had a, a limited impact on a, on a grassy area um, that was the shortest and the least complex um, um, drilling uh, pathway and um, was in the uh, a geologically sound of formation to, to meet the requirements of, of the, the spec. Um, while um, we it definitely understood that, you know, it's, it's in, uh, in, in the backyard there of a, of a, of a nice park um, that's um, you know, like, like we talked about, uh, you know, award-winning park uh, from when it was first uh, implemented there about 20 years ago. Um, we uh, um, saw that uh, as, as the best thing to provide this 
critical infrastructure for the west side of of uh, Portland um, that that um, has a, a short term impact for a long term um, um, solution for for the public. This is Tim. I want to make a, a more historical basis for. I'm not quite sure if she means how far up and down the river, but this location is largely the same one as the original. Uh, river crossing in Portland, we call it the Mill Street crossing. So there's um, there's existing easements, there's existing gaps in um, uh, piles that because the pipe was there, and and so that that is this. And, and there's existing infrastructure that connects the the pipes into the broader system. So this is why this particular site works really well. Um, we have we have investigated many locations up and down the river, but because of the historical nature of this crossing and its alignment with the original one, it it works. Uh, it it has spoiled to the top of the the most viable locations. When you say original, Tim, do you mean? I how, mean 18, how original, like eighteen ninety. Okay, that's when the first one was put in eighteen ninety. All right, thank you, Tim. Um, Joseph, I see your, your follow-up question here, so I'm gonna grab it. Uh, Joseph asked for clarification on, on I think, what Nolan said uh, around pumps, water pumps. Um, are they gonna run 24 seven for two years? Uh, thanks for your question. Um, no, uh, they will not. Um, so to construct the, the shaft, um, um, they'll be uh, drilled uh, with, with the secant piles. And as we excavate down the material inside of, of the concrete walls there, um, that's when uh, we'll utilize pumps to um, make sure that material is, is uh, dry and provides a safe working um, area for the crews. And as we get down to the bottom, um, we'll install, it's often called a rat slab, um, but a, a giant concrete mat on the bottom that will um, basically still off the bottom of the shaft. And at that point, the, the pumps will be uh, turned off there. Okay. A recurring theme when we talk about this project that, you know, when we build that shaft, that's gonna be pretty impactful. It's gonna be impactful because we're putting in the secant piles, we'll be running the pumps, we'll be bringing in trucks to take the dirt away. But that it's really, I've heard people on our team say, it sounds like it's really gonna it's going to drop off quite a bit in terms of noise and trucks and impact once we've put in at least at that location at the shaft it's going to be a little it's just going to be a lot different when we're done with the shaft is that something you you to concur with nolan yeah i yeah, i agree with that it's um definitely uh you know the, the biggest um part of um what needs to be built in order to to um implement the the pipe cross itself i think you said that's about three to six months, right? If I was me, if it was me, the communications person, I would just say six months round up and try to make people happy if it was less time, but three to six months is about the amount of time it takes to build a, a shaft like that, we're hoping. Yeah, so a little left. Not two years. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And that, that's for the, the pumps for the, the dewatering of, of um, the, the inside of the shaft as, like so, as we um, build that. Related to the shaft, um, Nolan, do you happen to have a height and depth? Uh, sure. Uh, the, the depth of that shaft um, is just over 90 feet deep uh, from the surface. Um, the secant piles will, will drill a little bit deeper. Um, that will just um, tie in to just on top of the bedrock um, formation called the Troutdale Formation. Um, and the, the working surface there is roughly 90 feet deep. 90 feet deep. And how wide? Uh, it's 38 feet in uh, interior diameter with um, five foot secants is the plan that might be able to get down to four foot. Uh, we're, we're working through that. Nine feet by 38 feet. Pretty big. Uh, we still have some some questions coming in uh, here. 
Um, another question related to staging and haul routes from Diana Stewart. Uh, will you be laying out pipe along the surface of Montgomery to be fed into the tunnel? And how long will the pipe be? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, at this location, it, it will not. Um, the run from the shaft at the park to the shaft at Harbor is just over 800 feet. Um, they will be installed in 20 foot um, pipe sections uh, due to the constraints of, of the shaft there. And, and really just how the micro tunnel um, 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 machine operates. And maybe we can pull up a picture there from um, the slide. I think it was like slide 12 or 15. So yeah, so right there in the, the micro tunneling, um, it shows the, the front end of that machine there, uh, middle uh, doing the cutting. And this one uh, shows specifically uh, concrete uh, pipes that are, are being laid. So you can see in the upper right hand corner, there's a, a crane that's lowering a section of, of concrete pipe there. Um, so what we'll be able to do is, is uh, put about 20, uh, maybe 24 foot um, sections of pipe. They'll be lowered down the, that 90 feet into the shaft, um, uh, installed, um, you know, connected to the, the pipe ram there on, on the back end. It'll be welded to the previous section um, and then uh, we'll, we'll push forward. Um, so, so that that's how we're planning on bringing the pipe. So it, it will not be um, staged along Montgomery. Um, the what we'll have a pipe within that yard there, uh, in order to to do the the day's worth of operation, and we'll be bringing in pieces of pipe um, 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 throughout to, to support that. Thank you, Nolan. Um, this question is from Ron Doctor on the topic of staging and haul routes. Uh, when work is complete, will concrete pit walls and floor be removed? And how will you deal with settling in the 100 feet deep pit? Um, yeah, uh, th thanks for that question. So uh, the shaft components will be uh, abandoned in place. Um, it will be done so in, in such a way that um, it works with our seismic requirements so that when a big earthquake does happen, um, that load of the shaft uh, isn't imparted onto the pipe. Um, and uh, so we won't be demoing the, the concrete um, until we get near the top where uh, we'll remove a section uh, of the top there, um, normally the five to 10 feet of that in order to um, to backfill that uh, and start working on the restoration of the park. Um, there are different fills that will be used in the backfilling um, uh, between some concrete near the bottom um, and then the engineer fill that will be brought up in, a, um, in lifts that are, are tested to uh, make sure they achieve the proper compaction um, within that shaft. Um, and then as we get to the top and it's um, a difference of, um, you know, the right uh, materials for, for soils and, and putting the, the park and grass back. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, we've got 20 minutes left or so. I'm going to move on to a, another topic, the topic of noise and vibration. We've gotten some questions related to that. Um, Diana, um, addressing your question uh, to the team, you, in you intend to get a noise variance, so there will be greater noise than the city normally permits. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so with, with the noise variance, uh, for all work that, that happens at night, um, uh, it is the standard of, to have to uh, apply for that to, to get that, that work. Because you're out, it's more that you're outside of those hours um, outside of the six, uh, PM, I, I believe. Um, so that's what that um, is um, dictating on on that that permitting, not necessarily the the sound. Um, throughout all the city, um, there there's construction work that that goes on at, at night to to help reduce impacts to the, the traveling public and, and communities. Um, and it's not something that 
Um, as a guy who's worked over two years straight on night shift, um, it's not something that you look forward to doing, uh, but sometimes it's necessary in order to um, to get get the work in. Thanks, Nolan. Um, and thanks for the question. Um, here's another one related to noise and vibration. According to the CDC, repeated exposure to noise over 70 decimals can cause hearing loss. And at 85 decimals can cause loss of even one time over eight hours. Will the project consult with an audiologist to ensure breaks and noise? Um, so not to exceed 10 hours, uh, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and not for multiple days in a row. Uh, yeah, uh, th thank you for the question. Um, uh, as far as as just 70 decibels itself, um, you know, that's that's pretty low uh, on standard. I, I'm sure if you did a quick Google search, uh, you can um, see a variety of different charts that would show what 70 decibels is. Um, uh, I want to iterate that it is measured at 50 feet um, outside of the noise source, um, so it's not directly at it. Um, there, there is. Uh, a correlation to distance, um, and then um, as as the question indicates, uh, are asked um, with time. Um, uh, we, we've talked about the 85 noise uh, decibel uh, rating, and and those are the um, the levels of, of the maximum that 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 we're um, for for typical work there. Um, the recent work we did out there on Montgomery to uh, do a, a type of soil sampling called CPT. Uh, we had our, our drill out there um, that was mounted within the, the drill rig. Uh, and Ron, I, I believe, if we met you out there, we, we, we looked over some of that. And, um, um, you know, that, that stuff was under 85 decibels. Um, so, um, there, you know, when we talk about 85, you know, th those are the, the limits um, that are typically associated. But uh, it is acknowledged that working around um, close up to, to that uh, noise, it, that can have a, an effect. Um, we have not consulted with an audiologist or a, a person in that, um, that role. A lot of times I think that would be um, industrial hygienists um, would, would be in that, and that's something we, we can explore and, and look into uh, in, in the future. Um, a part of that was, uh, like I said, doing the, the background um, um, sound study. Um, um, that uh, even in that that park where it's it's pretty soft, um, there there is some some pretty loud noises that come from the, the traveling um, traffic, um, I five bridge and river traffic, and um, just some of the activities around there. But um, um, yeah, we I, I appreciate the question, and, and it's definitely um, of concern. We'll, we'll continue working on on mitigating that impact. Thanks, Nolan. Um, another question related to noise and vibration. Um, this one's from Ron Doctor. Ron asks, how many decibel reduction in noise do you anticipate from sound barriers? Uh, another great question around sound. Um, there, there's a few different products out there um, and uh, you know that are variable in, in what they do. Um, uh, a lot of uh, sound dampening materials that you can put on, um, say like the, the, the fencing, uh, you can see uh, a reduction of, of the three to five decibels. Um, uh, with, with sound, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, kind of if you can see the source, you can usually hear the source. So, so there's uh, some challenge with that, um, but um, yeah, it, usually in uh, the three to five decibel lowering, um, uh, some products potentially could be be more than that, but I, I would say five is, is a good, good rule of thumb there on, on potential reduction. All right, reduction around five decibels. Uh, let's see if we have more noise and vibration. Um, one more from Ron. Uh, Nolan, if you can answer this, do you know what the noise level will be near McCormick and Schmick's and Sports Bar specifically? Uh, yeah, so um, the the edge of the shaft to um, McCormick and Smith, and I believe the sports bar is on the southwest side of the traffic circle there, so a little further away, but I, I believe you know it's a distance of about 150 feet, 
to about where the outdoor seating area is and a little bit further to get to that, that front door. Um, so, uh, you know, a little bit farther away, but still uh, relatively um, uh, close as far as, uh, you know, being a distance. Um, the, the fencing will be right uh, up and around that um, uh, uh, work. Um, and, and during the tunneling, uh, you know, most of that, uh, the tunneling uh, machine itself will be uh, underground and, and having some of the equipment down there. Um, there will be some top side stuff, but um, uh, it's about 150 feet from the source uh, of, of construction noise. Joseph added on here um, to ask, he says many of us will be living well above the pit and he asks if something is being done to mitigate rising sound. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, so part of what we're um, uh, you going to be using to, to mitigate sound is on um, putting uh, sound curtains around the um, the engines on some of the separation plants there on, on the, the mining equipment um, that will, will be up above that, that eight foot fence. Um, you know, in a, in a, if, if there was a limited time and money, you could potentially build a 20 story building over all the, the construction equipment to, to keep it all in, but um, not, not very uh, feasible, but, um, but doing stuff like putting um, some sound uh, blankets around equipment that's above that, um, along with the, the noise um, or the panels uh, inside the, um, the site there uh, will, will help dampen that before uh, it travels up. And, and again, um, a function of, of distance um, from, from the source. So I appreciate your question though. All right. Uh... That segues into um, safety and aesthetics. Uh, we have a couple questions related around that topic or those topics. Um, this question is from Anonymous. What landscape firm has been consulted or hired to restore the park to its original design? Uh, they note that the park was designed by one of Portland's icons, Doug Macy and his, and his team, Walker Macy. The Parks and Recreation Bureau have demonstrated over the years that they do not have the capability to offer proper restoration. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for your question. I'll, I'll address some of those, those parts of that question. Um, our professional landscaper is within our design build firm, uh, Stantec. Uh, Stantec is a multinational uh, design firm and um, been uh, in the city for several decades now. Uh, I believe um, an earlier um, subsidiary of them did an initial study of the crossing back in, in uh, the 70s, I, I believe, Tim, there on the initial feasibility study of the crossing. Um, specific to that park, uh, the landscaping there, um, Walker Macy did do uh, that first design uh, of the park. Um, they um, they ha you know have been I guess the from what I've heard recently the parks department has been um, looking at um, bringing uh, Walker Macy into the fold as far as their long term maintenance plan uh, and and some of those um, features in the park have served their their lifetime so there's there's some uh, plants and shrubs that you know kind of need to be switched out um, and it just happened to kind of correlate with uh, our project. So now we have this opportunity to, um, you know, put uh, all these um, people and their knowledge and, and resources together in order to um, get that park um, um, uh, restored into, um, you know, wh what it uh, is and, and where it can be. I Thank saw, oh, I had ahead. a quick follow up on that one. I saw a, a comment about the cypress trees and the lily ponds. My understanding is that we're not, we're trying to stay far away from the ponds. Is that correct? It's absolutely correct. Okay. We'll, we'll be fencing off um, before we, we get to the, the lily ponds. So the interior part of the park um, really will, will be um, untouched. Uh, it's really the, the open grass space and call it that first um, berm of, of bushes and, and plants 
uh, along that pathway there uh, that separates the interior of the, the park before you get to the strand and um, in between the open space and, and the, the walkway, the river walkway uh, before you get down to the marina. This next question is from another question from Diana Stewart. Um, at the end of the project, all of the concrete from the eight to nine foot story pits will need to be jackhammered out and hauled away. Is that correct? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part of that? Um, she says, so at the end of the project, all of the concrete from the eight to the nine foot story pits will need to be jackhammered and hauled away. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, I think in early response to the previous question there on the, the, the pit, the the sea camp piles will be remaining. Um, uh, there will be some um, things done while we backfill to make sure uh, it works seismically within um, uh, the, 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 the technical requirements of the waterline. But as we get to the top, um, it, it would only be not only the, the five to 10 feet, but the top of those secret piles that, that get uh, removed. Um, so not the eight or nine stories worth um, or the 90 feet of it. Um, so it's a lot less than, than um, the state in the question there. Okay. And there's a follow-up question in there uh, from her. What engineering has been done to determine the impact on the foundations of the buildings next door? Uh, so there, um, part of our, our shaft design, um, you know, considers one, uh, you know, the safe working environment to install that, um, and then uh, the seismic stuff around that. Uh, so uh, foundation considerations have been considered in, in our, our design, and, and that's um, to get that specific for, for how far away uh, that building is, um, probably have to... Um, research that to get a, a more precise answer on that. Uh, but we have looked at the, the as-built drawings from the different buildings around um, uh, the, the location. Um, and our, our analysis has been that they will impact that um, from the, the, our, our design firm. All right, we have a few more questions and we've got about five minutes left or so before we'll wrap up. Um, this is a staging and haul route construction from Ron Doctor. Why can't the pipeline be located on the south side of the Markham Bridge on the east and at the Zidell, Zidell property on the west? Um, yeah, th th thanks for the question. Um, I am going to defer to Tim on this one. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, I believe, the hydraulics of the water system it, itself, and and where uh, certain crossings uh, exist, and and um and go from there. Yeah. So this is a similar um, response to what I was talking about with the history um, and the way that the water system has been built up in the past. Um, it would. To, to go in that um, direction um, would mean that there would be more um, pipe to get, to move us from where our header pipes are on the east and the west side to connect to that. So it becomes um, more challenging and potentially more impactful to get the pipes to the crossing. Right, because it would be more above ground like accessing yeah. the pipes above ground. So cutting up more streets yeah. on busy roads to connect from, you know, we have sort of a point A and a point B where our existing water system is that it's carrying lots of water to and from and up and down through the city. And so then to change the whole configuration of that, you'd have to also then add pipes in additional neighborhoods in more areas to like reconfigure the system with these large that pipes that aren't are also just come up they're more costly right the larger pipes to that you to do transmission mains are just bigger and more impactful yeah that's that's a good way of saying it thank you i've i've, I've been asked this question before so <laughs> i've been learning the answer I've, trying to figure it out now yeah. yeah no it's that's good 
All right, uh, time for one more question. This is related to traffic and access um, from Joseph. Um, Joseph says that there's recently been a change so that drivers can't turn right on Harrison from NATO. Traffic has to come down to Harbor Drive to turn right. Can this get changed during this project? Yeah, I, that uh, that reconfiguration of NATO was a, a PBOT project that um, isn't fully um, a part of our job. Um, the I believe the right hand turn is the one going northbound that comes down to Harbor Drive. If I understand that right, and I believe there's a turn lane, but um, I um, not specifically tied to the construction of a water line. Tim, I, I don't know if you have any to add on top of that i guess i'm having a little bit of a hard time on recalling where this might be um but i will say as a global um approach to the project we will not be impacting the roads once we're done the road system will remain the same as it is today when we finish the project that's one of the goals and I, I guess I, I reread that question there. So that right turn on, on Harrison, I, I believe is when you come right off of like a, a Ross um, Island Bridge there. And I believe that's a really tight radius and it's probably got even tighter for um, um, the, the new multi-user path that the NATO project uh, installed. So I, I would venture to guess um, that it's a turning radius um, uh, issue. Um, and um, you know why why that may have been taken away, or may, maybe it wasn't a official right hand turn. Because I know there's a no right hand turn there, um, but it's definitely a good question that can be looked into of potential uh, detours um, that we can investigate. All right. I hope. That answered your question for now, Joseph, and we we can look in that look into that for further detour routes. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Kristen to to take us out um, with final remarks. Thanks, Lauren, and thank you all for sharing your time and your questions with us tonight. Um, I see that we have some unanswered questions and uh, we've run out of time. So <clears throat> I would encourage you to take a look at the project website. Um, we have an FAQ document there that is regularly being added to and revised. Your questions may be answered there. Um, you can also look for future outreach material. And then additionally, I would encourage you to take a look at the um, fact sheets that have been developed and and um, we I think Lauren posted a link um, on how to find them they may be a good source of information for you as well as always you can take a look at um, the website and um, post a question there as well um, the meeting tonight will be recorded, as we've mentioned, um, and a follow-up email with a link to the recording will be sent out to attendees. We'll also be presenting um, at tomorrow night's Downtown Neighborhood Association meeting from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, if you'd like to join us again, um, um, if, you, if you would like to join that meeting, please refer to the Downtown Neighborhood Association's website for instructions on how to take part in that. Um, I'd just like to thank you all again and invite Tim back on to provide some final uh, final comments. I know we are um, running very short on time. Tim. Yeah, once again, I, I would like to thank everybody for their time and their interest. Um, we understand your, um, your concerns with the project and we're going to work the best we can to to discuss them with you to try to um, minimize the impacts to the neighborhood uh, that's one of the fundamental goals of the project um, is to be a good neighbor so once again i would like to thank you for your uh, vigorous discussion and good questions totally appreciate it um, and i look forward to talking to you in the future thank you very much